In Savannah, there are two neighborhoods I want to share with you. One is Kyla Brownsville, a neighborhood, an older neighborhood where uh, it was primarily homeowners. Pam Jones is going to talk about how homeowners got involved and helped turn this neighborhood around. The second story is going to be from Linda Larry in the East Victoria neighborhood, a neighborhood that's largely renters and was built around the late 1800s. Together, they make up a strong Savannah story, a story about a strong partnership between community leaders and city government, how they revitalized their neighborhoods, how they engaged people using principles of the gifts of citizens, involving associations, and how together they strengthened and revitalized and made a vibrant community. Savannah, Georgia. Home to two neighborhoods that have revitalized themselves through the principles of asset-based community development. In the early 70s, the neighborhoods of Kyler Brownsville and East Victoria, like many neighborhoods across the country, fell apart and degenerated into dangerous, unhealthy communities. The Kyler Brownsville neighborhood was at one time very vibrant, um, economically feasible community, very self-supporting. Um, many professional African Americans lived here. Skilled craftsmen lived in this community and raised their families. There were businesses here that supported the community. Grocery stores and shops and barber shops, um, local restaurants. And as urban renewal came in and the generations grew and moved away from the neighborhood, the neighborhood became like many other neighborhoods in this country and in the United States. It became a neighborhood that fostered criminal activity, um, drug activity, um, dilapidated housing, and we found ourselves in a situation where we were losing this community. I could see the, the crime around us, you know. One time we could have just used our door and leave our door open all night long, you know. Now everybody was locking their door, putting something behind their door to keep people from coming on. We could have sit on the porch and then worry about, you know, drive-by shootings or anything like that. And in, in, in the early 90s, you know, that's all we had. We couldn't even send them. We, couldn't, we were scared to send our kids out to even play, you know, outside. When neighborhoods begin to deteriorate, it can be very difficult to turn them around. Whether it's attracting new business, new residents, or government support, once a reputation is established, all outsiders can see are the problems. I used to be a mortgage lender, so I worked in the banks for a while. And when we talked about the homes and the money that would be given to people to help them get into the home, basically all they would need is a thousand dollars, they would say, oh no. I would never live in that neighborhood. Even people who were coming out of some of the worst projects in Savannah, they were like, oh no, I would never live over there. It's terrible over there. Because the reputation had just gotten so, it was a reputation that was taking us a long time to live down. This prevalent attitude is a fundamental reason why change is so difficult for so many organizations and communities. If all anyone can perceive in a community are needs, then all they see are problems that need to be solved. Thankfully, the residents of Savannah had city officials that were able to think differently. The typical mode is to go in and say, we have got to fix this, and here is a linear path to that fix. And that linear path might pat a few people on the head, and, and then you move on with it. But and that's okay, but you're not going to be successful until you go through that engagement, which is uncomfortable. Sometimes it can even seem to set you back. But once you have everybody on board, then it's going to be a, a, a better fulfillment. It's going to be more lasting. It's going to be more widespread. And, and then after that learning curve, it's going to be more amicable because people will trust each other. They know each other. So the secret in Savannah was a shift in the relationship between the city and the residents a shift that was the result of two very specific attitudes. First was the city's belief that they couldn't solve the neighborhood's problems unilaterally. They needed to listen to and engage the residents. Second was the residents' belief that they had a responsibility to each other and their community to lead the change. It shouldn't be the city that solves it. It should be the people who live here who should solve it. It should be the people who 
don't know where their children are. That when you <laughs> look in your house and it's midnight and your 10 year old isn't in the house, that's you. You need to make sure that that's done because you owe that to the community. To care about their own community. Don't, don't just have the attitude that I live here, but I don't really want to, I don't really want to be involved with the, with the strengths or the weaknesses. Uh, be willing to, to come to some community meetings and uh, to, to get angry about things that are bad and then to support those things that are good. This shift in attitudes is anything but trivial. By recognizing the need for the residents to direct the change in their communities, the city's role changed from simply providing services to recruiting, supporting, and creating community leaders. I was sitting on the step and I often tell the stories when I'm talking to a group or something like that. I was sitting on the porch step and um, he came up to me and told me that they was looking for people to work in the community, you know. And I gave him a statement like, mm, not me, because every time I look on TV, you know, and I listen on TV, they talking about renters, you know, how trashy they are and whatever. And I said, that just made me angry. So he told me, so well, you need to get off your butt and do something about it. And the residents' attitudes changed from expecting handouts from the city to using government resources to benefit their objectives and goals. So the city is there as a tool, the county government is there as a tool for us to use them, for them to gather information to help us understand our problems better, to do all the statistics, um, to go out and find the grants for us, but also to train us how to do that. And I give the city credit for that. They do a wonderful job with their leadership academies and things of that nature. It's just so amazing to me when I see people who are sometimes basically illiterate, understanding these basic concepts of government, um, concepts of social policy. It, it's just a wonderful thing to sit in a group of people and like, no, she doesn't have a high school diploma, and no, she doesn't have a college diploma, but she knows what she's talking about and she can get to the essence of what needs to be done. These are the people that have been overlooked through the years. You know, we have all these, um, what is it in our community, we have all these, the black leaders. I'm like, who? <laughs> you know. Where are they? Nobody told me. Nobody asked me. Our leaders are the people that get up and go to work every day, who catch the bus at 5 a.m. and then go to the second job at 6 p.m. and try to figure out how are they going to care for their kids in the meantime. And those are our leaders. And as each and every one of the people in these communities are the leaders for these communities. So the city of Savannah recognized that success in the neighborhoods was contingent on community leadership. So they took an active role in recruiting and training community leaders. You have to be pragmatic about it. You have to recognize that people are busy and so forth. But the way that we've done it is a lot of neighborhood meetings, uh, block captains, all that. But the other way is to have training sessions, you know, if they can, in the evenings or in the weekends, where they, we have a community leadership training where they understand the trade-offs involved. Uh, but but you have to be very practical about trying to get leadership and you're going to have to realize some of the leaders you're not going to agree with them some of them are going to go off in other different directions it's just like any other <laughs> any other area of civic life it's not predictable and it's not always pleasant but ultimately you'll get to a, gr a larger group of people who are fairly sophisticated about what can be done and what needs to be done in their neighborhood one citizen-based initiative that was developed with the city was Savannah's Grants for Blocks program. This highly successful program offered grants of up to $500 for any resident initiative that would enhance the community. Each year, hundreds of applications were submitted to clean abandoned lots, create gardens, build playgrounds, and repair sports facilities. But beyond these benefits, Grants for Blocks planted seeds in the citizens of the community. Seeds that blossomed into hope, confidence, and leadership. Seeds that demonstrated a real partnership with the city. For the first time in decades, the city officials and community leaders brought people together in their community and created a sense of pride in their neighborhood and themselves. We have a beautiful neighborhood around here, you know, and when we found out that we had funds that we can use to help us with that, you know, we really got excited then, you know what I'm saying? Because we, we went to work because 
we did our survey in the neighborhood to find out where the community as a whole wanted to see different. And everybody had a similar, you know, they wanted something safe and something um, educated for the kids. And everybody just wanted to be able to enjoy their neighborhood in the whole sense. You know. The principles of asset-based community development emphasize that organizations can lead by stepping back. The city of Savannah and its residents clearly demonstrate the power of this principle. So you have to step away from it while they know you're still caring and that you're willing to come in and partner with them, but they, they want to make sure they're the ones that are driving key decisions and that they are a, vi a vital part of leadership. Initially, that they have to be the leadership. They, they don't even want the mayor to come in and say, I'm going to do this. They want the mayor to say, I'm here to help you. It's kind of like we're all warriors. And this is our war. And the general can't do it. And the colonels can't do it. Each individual soldier has to do their part. And, I, and I'm just a firm believer, just a firm believer in that. In a relatively short period of time, neighborhoods in Savannah went from this to this. From this to this. And from this to this. Kyler Brownsville and East Victoria have been revitalized and are now thriving neighborhoods with active residents and vibrant communities.